that was very informative. All right, we are now going to hear from Dr. Gordon Thompson, who's a research professor at Clark University and the executive director of the Institute for Resource and Security Studies up in Cambridge. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, I have this slide. Thank you. Um, my presentation is supported by three declarations that uh, I've asked to be distributed to the commissioners that were produced on behalf of a uh, consortium of environmental groups around the United States. But this presentation is strictly my own uh, views. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows a low-density rack. Uh, the NRC staff <coughs> appears to have uh, forgotten what a low-density rack uh, uh, looks like. Uh, these used to be standard. Uh, in my view, it's a <coughs> reason what a low-density rack uh, uh, looks like uh, these used to be standard. Uh, in my view, it's a <clears throat> reasonably respectable piece of nuclear engineering, uh, passively safe against uh, water loss under most circumstances. Next slide, please. Uh, I don't expect you to read all the detail of this uh, slide on the screen, but um, the point is that the staff has looked at only a small fraction of the possible scenarios that could lead to loss of water in the event of an accident or an attack. And I'll return to probabilities of these events uh, later. So there's a large number of scenarios that are just not addressed at all in staff analysis to date. Next slide, please. This uh, slide shows a situation of partial loss of water from a spent fuel pool, which I describe as the severe reference case. This represents many possible scenarios for loss of water, and for three decades plus, the NRC has refused to systematically study this case. Even though there has been a partial precedent uh, in the PAX-2 accident in Hungary in 2003. Next slide, please. This slide shows uh, what I describe as ignition delay time which is uh, the shortest time required for spent fuel to heat up to the point of circular ignition. Uh, this shows that we're dealing with a relatively slow developing uh, incident uh, for fuel aged 1,000 days, a little over three years. We're looking at 21 hours in the fastest case for heat up. So you might think if the accident is so, or the incident is so slow developing, why should we worry about it? Next slide, please. This gives a hint as to why we might worry about it uh, a great deal. This uh, illustrative case shows the on-site contamination due to a reactor release. It's a simplified illustrative case, but in this instant, average over the first day, a lethal dose would be accrued in four minutes of exposure, and over the first seven days, within 10 minutes of exposure, suggesting that in this uh, instant, and Others like it, um, mitigating actions would be precluded if they involved any human action on site. Um, next slide, please. Outcomes, why are we worried? Um, we've had uh, two large actual releases. Uh, in the Chernobyl case, um, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, retrospectively concluded that uh, this release was perhaps the dominant cause of the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, and one could extend that to the Warsaw Pact. So dramatic uh, political and social effects. In Fukushima, where we have a fallout of only six petabacarols, there are to this day 160,000 people reportedly uh, displaced, and the entire nuclear fleet is shut down. Look at potential releases. The NRC uh, has looked at a peach bottom release of 330 petabacarols, leading to long term displacement of 4.1 million people, which I'd submit would be a national disaster. The uh, French agency IRSN uh, has attempted to add up all the economic damage from a hypothetical release of 100 petabacarols at the Dampierre facility and their high case is $8 trillion, which is about half the current U.S. gross domestic product. Next slide, please. 
Inventory is available for release. Uh, each pool at Peach Bottom, 2200 paddleback rules, twice what's in the Fukushima Unit 4 pool. And a great deal more than the six paddleback rules uh, fall out from Japan. Um, and uh, circumstances at Peach Bottom uh, could uh, lead to a release uh, in the range of 2,000 paddleback rules, vastly greater than what we experienced at Chernobyl or uh, Fukushima. Next slide, please. Brings us to some broad questions about risk. Um, uh, it's uh, common to say that risk is the product of probability and consequences. Uh, although that's common, it's important to be clear that this is not a scientific statement. It's a statement of ideology. It's a statement of value and has no scientific basis. What should be an indicator of probability? Uh, given the scale of consequences of a very large release of cesium, I believe an appropriate indicator would be the number of occurrences per century across all nuclear facilities in the United States. The probability and consequences uh, could be determined in larger or dominant part by uh, qualitative factors. And that's uh, particularly true of uh, potential attacks. Uh, and having uh, a large amount of uh, uh, cesium position where it can be released by attack, uh, I submit actually attracts attack and increases the, the uh, probability. Uh, it's, I think, uh, legitimate to describe uh, spent fuel pools adjacent to operating reactors as uh, pre emplaced radiological weapons awaiting activation by an enemy of the United States. Final observation uh, is that the staff has for more than three decades focused on rapid and total loss of water from spent fuel pools. Um, this is a reprise of a focus in the 1960s uh, on large break loss of coolant accidents from reactors. And this, um, in my view, fundamentally warped the design of reactors uh, in terms of containments and uh, safety systems. Next slide, please. Fukushima incident, uh, uh, some people take as a sign of reassurance. I take it as a wake-up uh, call. Next slide, please. Now, reverting to low-density open frame racks, and I'm talking about true low-density open frame racks, uh, not the low-density case considered by the NRC staff. The cost driver is uh, predominantly the transfer cost the transfer fuel from uh, uh, high-density racks to dry casks. Now, this transfer is going to occur anyway when the reactors are shut down uh, in the absence of a repository or a centralized uh, store. Thus, the incremental cost of acting now is simply the time value of the transfer cost. The preceding speaker from EPRI <coughs> quoted around $3.5 billion. Uh, it's meant that the true cost is substantially less than that. It's whatever the time value is of that cost. Uh, there is an issue of high burnout fuel, which uh, complicates the transfer to dry casks. That's symptomatic of a larger problem with high burnout fuel that I believe requires attention. Final slide, please. Conclusions. <clears throat> Given the information available, I believe that the uh, commissioners should order the rapid reversion of all pools in the United States to low-density open frame racks. That would require excess spent fuel to be transferred to dry storage. The commissioners should also uh, require the staff to scrap its um, pool fire consequence study and its tier three analysis and send them back to uh, do a really thorough, open, and science-based inquiry into the phenomena related to uh, pool fires, uh, including risk linkages between pools and reactors. And in the declarations that I've submitted and that I mentioned earlier, I've laid out in some detail what uh, those investigations should cover. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the issue of cast fires uh, should be addressed, and uh, I can explain what I mean by that uh, if necessary. And this inquiry should be internationalized because pool hazards um, 
exist elsewhere. The Hag in France is a good example where there are four poles uh, positioned so that the mid height of the fuel is about at grade level and they're licensed to hold almost 18,000 tons of uh, spent fuel. Uh, it's, I think the largest spent fuel has done a lot of Hence, an international inquiry would be appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Oh yeah, go on, click the subscribe button. We need to get subscribed and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the Remix button, hit the Remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.